Hast du ihre Ratten? And just to quickly reiterate, this is how the flow of today's program will work. Each contestant has 30 minutes to share their pitch with you all. Um, you can break up that 30 minutes however you want mm -hmm. to. Give you some short solutions where you go to slide questions. We have a timer here right here on the side. So if you need to make sure you need to keep track of your time, it will also mm -hmm. be here as well. Um, a really quick introduction to all of our judges. We have Peter Benedorf who is a collaborator. We have Molly Swagin who is a flyer consultant. We have Ms. Sharon Freeman. Okay. So uh, we're going to get started. We're going to start with the blooming circle where mm -hmm. Mr. Cole Carter and he's mm -hmm. going to show you all his pitch. All right. Thank you. So hello, hello everyone. Again, I am Nicole Carter, founder of the Blooming Circle. Before we get started, I want to let you know that uh, for those watching and those in the room, there is a QR code on this slide deck. And so you can use that QR code to uh, go along with this presentation with me to make sure that we are accessible today. The Blooming Circle is an organization committed to increasing health access for women of color through advocacy, conversation, and education. The organization Girl Trek demanded that women, and in particular women of color, never ask for permission to save our own lives. Women of color have become used to advocating for ourselves when the world around us has failed to do so. Here are three prime examples. Sorry. Wakisha Stewart was a 31-year-old new mother with crushing chest pain and vomiting, and she was dismissed as, anxiety, as having anxiety in the ER after being made to wait in the waiting room for almost 20 minutes she was finally recognized by a nurse as having symptoms of a heart attack. That is when, and only when, they treated her. And then we have Angela Vasquez, a 32-year-old woman experiencing shortness of breath, brain fog, pain, who visited the ER a month after being diagnosed with COVID. And when she went there, she was told her symptoms were just anxiety, and then later, when she got upset, she was told that she was being hysterical until she was finally hospitalized for what is now known as long COVID. And then we also have Tanushri Sangutta, whose family and even her South Asian doctor, a guy, minimized her mental health concerns until she was hospitalized after an attempted suicide. Even when she got care, that care was not inclusive, and her family said that it was kind of silly for her to be in the hospital for these things. But in response to this type of treatment, these women engaged and created health organizations for women that spoke to their needs. Wakisha, for example, became an advocate for other birthing people and women particularly those who are black women uh, experiencing postpartum heart attacks. Angela Vasquez did something similar. She created an organization for Latina women who are experiencing long COVID. And then finally, Tanushri created something similar for South Asian women who were experiencing mental health concerns. She partnered mental wellness 
with traditional cultural South Asian care. Like these women, the Blooming Circle is my response to demand that I and we save our own lives. So there are many national problems. These are only a few. But on a national level, women of color face a range of challenges when it comes to accessing health care. Some of the factors include lower rates of health insurance, humiliation, minimization of pain, devaluing knowledge and traditions, uh, health treatments being seen as a weakness, which we just kind of discussed. These things are all connected to implicit bias, discrimination, and disempowerment. So this might seem out of place a bit, this slide here, but it is actually the, in the perfect place. So it's in the perfect place because it's my opportunity to share with you who I am and how I am connected to this work. So this is my capacity to bloom. For the last few years, I've owned my own small business dedicated to web development, content design, marketing, those types of things. I'm a former college professor, a women's center director, and I have degrees from business administration to women's studies to public health, all of the above. And then I also threw in a PhD in there. Um, I'm a board member for Queens Village Dayton, which focuses on black women's maternal health. And on the Fighting Breast Cancer Advisory Board. I'm the second social action, uh, the social action coordinator for the state of Ohio for my sorority, and the second vice president within my chapter focusing on social justice, which often looks like health equity and social uh, and reproductive justice for the same sorority. And probably the most important part here today is that I'm an advocate here trying to save my own life as a, a survivor, I say, and thriver of Crohn's disease, lupus, as well as scleroderma. This organization is my way of saving my life. So my problems that I shared and the problems uh, of the three women that I shared earlier all connect to local problems as well. And that's why that slide was placed here. After combining two separate surveys uh, from October to November and then April, uh, March to April, now uh, it has increased 140 women identifying themselves as women of color between the ages of 19 and 76, all greater Dayton residents have indicated various things, but they fall into three themes. The first is providers, the second is resources, and the third is activities. And so, as you can see, I won't read everything on the slide, but three of the main issues were a lack of communication and listening skills by providers, and resources, there was a lack of resources specifically for women of color, and then when it came to activities, there was a lack of support and support groups specifically for women of color. We plan to continue this survey uh, as long as the organization uh, exists because this information is always relevant, will always be used to ensure that we are meeting the needs of women of color in the greater Dayton area, but also fulfilling our mission and our vision. So the Blooming Circle is dedicated to serving women seeking care. We do not use the term patient in the organization. So we use uh, people seeking care or women seeking care, which includes adult age, black, indigenous, Latina, and Hispanic, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Middle Eastern women from the greater Dayton community. Also, we serve providers who are health and wellness providers, those in the greater Dayton area, but also those who are online serving women of color in the greater Dayton area. Um, and they must have an interest in helping women of color. We have a four-part solution, which I'll go into more but this solution is our way of making sure that we are advocating, engaging in conversation, and engaging in education. So we have organized all of these things into PEDALS. And so PEDAL 1 meets a, a community need of uh, having access to providers who are culturally competent and who listen and communicate well. Our solution 
was the creation of a seven module training pilot program for health and wellness professionals. So in July of 2022, when the organization started, this was our first priority. I personally carefully uh, curated a curriculum um, designed to focus on meeting the, de the needs of women of color. In October 22, we launched the pilot training suite and have since had 88 providers enroll, 87% of which showed a change in perspective, 95% showed that they would uh, show that they would use the content from the uh, training program to care for women of color. We've also received approval to provide seven continuing education units for the completion, which now also provides guidance in a fee for a fee-based enrollment process between $39 and $108, and that it is a gap because everything that we charge is on a uh, sliding scale to make it accessible. We are planning to launch the course officially, so moving away from the pilot to an official course on May 18th, my mother's birthday. And again, every quarter, so again in August. And we hope to enroll 100 providers uh, by August 18th, 2023, and to have 85% of those providers complete uh, the, the course, but also the evaluation so that we can use those evaluations to improve the course. We have used the current feedback to revamp each mod module and we are building an organization and industry specific marketing campaign to launch by May 1st, my birthday. Pedal two is uh, community health conversations and this fulfills a community need of talking about specific health needs and experiences with other women of color in a safe and fun space. It is our Healthy Communities and Conversations Discussion and Brunch series, uh, the full name, which includes brunches, online discussions, book discussions, and starting in July, we will have our first educational webinar. So far, we have hosted three live online discussions, two Minority Health Month uh, podcast recordings, and one in-person brunch with the second scheduled for June 17th. Following this quarterly timeline, the brunch takes place every March, June, and August, and our goal is to have between 75 and 100 participants each time. The online discussions take place uh, April, July, and November, and February, which for our first three live discussions, we had a total of 2,745 viewers. Between, um, and that is between our pages, so YouTube, uh, Facebook and then we reposted it to Instagram. Our hope by November is to have increased the viewership by 50%. To sustain these activities, we've already used event evaluations to improve programming along with the creation of program planning advisory boards, some of who are here, two of them, uh, <laughs> that meet every Thursday prior to uh, the next event coming up. So we start six weeks out. Um, and mostly they plan like the larger brunches and things like that, so. Pedal three uh, fulfills the community need of providing up-to-date provider information and resources to the social determinants of health. It is our in the meantime directory. Um, and also to mention on the other slides, there were photos. Those are actually real-time photos of the first was of the provider training, a snapshot that was embedded. And then um, the last one was from the events, uh, the first brunch that we had. And then this is actually what that uh, provider uh, directory and resource directory looks like. And if you were to pull it up, that's exactly what you would see. Now you'll be able to see it a little bit better than what's on this slide, but you would see that. So um, this, uh, we launched the app in October 2022. And since we have had at least two new providers or resources added each week, uh, they are now basically adding themselves instead of us reaching out to them and saying, hey, uh, can we get your permission to be placed on uh, this provider directory? Uh, the provider listing features insurance type, sliding scale information, specialization area, diversity and inclusion of services, um, and the resources uh, that are separate are based on areas of wellness, such as emotional wellness, occupational wellness, um, and they feature, and we will continue to add videos, 
can, uh, emergency contacts, digital downloads, and more. So far, we also received a grant from Kajabi to pay for the platform itself of $1,000. In a survey of providers, they indicated that they would be willing to pay a fee to maintain their listing on the side, but a small fee, so not an exorbitant amount. Our relationship with Oregon Printing in this area as well uh, will allow us to create a mailer campaign to market the directory and save the dates for the next item I'm going to display. So pedal four, our final pedal, uh, fulfills a community need of providing access to accessible information in real time. It is our smartphone application with the interactive and real time chat option called Bloom. And that's an actual uh, picture of the avatar that I created for the, uh, the app. As of uh, a few days ago, we've received a total of $34,000 in funding towards the app. And so I think it, was, it has not been changed in your business plan, but it has been changed on the slide. Um, and funding towards the app, not including in-kind advertise, advertising funding uh, for the app from Google. Um, we were approved to work with Microsoft to build the prototype, and I have enrolled in She Designs user immersive tech program to ensure that I'm able to sustain and scale the app in case we cannot uh, find someone who will consistently help us to update it and to build it and to fine tune all of those things, but we hope to do that. We have collected data on the needs of women of color as it pertains to this area and are actively using it and will continue to use this, the, that information to scale the app. So our plan is to release the prototype with the volunteer chat line and community partners, the board, and uh, women in need of care for feedback in July 2023. Um, and again, on the screen is a mock-up of Bloom, the avatar uh, that I built as part of the app. Um, and I would like to mention that I am working to make sure that Bloom, the, the app, um, is a trademark um, application. So instead of an analysis of competition, we engage in an analysis of nonprofits that serve as a bridge to resources and do so in the greater Dayton area, but also do so on a larger scale as well. Um, so they are United Way, YWCA, and Pink Ribbon Good. Um, and so the United Way was chosen to examine a more general um, view and a YWCA because they specifically use anti-racist practices and uh, gender empowerment uh, as their underlying framework. Uh, and then Pink Ribbon Good because they are extremely specific in the services that they provide. And I like to call them bridge builders, but other people would call them navigators, health navigators, and things like that. So no one organization is better than the other, but we, the Blooming Circle included, offer very unique services for specific populations. Therefore, in comparison, the Blooming Circle is the only organization out of four that offers a smartphone app with embedded advocacy that chat, uh, and chat capability. So some of them offer a smartphone app, but it's like for events, um, keeping track of your schedule for events, um, things like that. And some of them might have some resources listed as well. Uh, we also have programs specific to women of color. Everything that we do uh, is ultimately serving women of color. Uh, a provider directory that is comprehensive and dynamic along with education designed to enhance care for women of color. So we have all of those things collectively as a collaborative package. Uh, the same is true when a comparison is made across the nation. So I live by the notion that behind every successful woman is a tribe of other successful women who have her back. The 14 women on this slide have done just that. They are the sowers, and by that I mean they are the nurturers and growers ensuring ideas become sustainable realities. They believe in the mission, vision, and goals of the Blooming Circle. But most importantly, they believe in me. We have experts in public and community health, finance and fundraising, curriculum development and education, mental health and social work as we were approved recently to hire social work students from Ohio State 
uh, University beginning in the fall. Experts in business development, uh, everything, human resources, you name it. Um, organization building, uh, community engagement, and, um, and then I would like to point out, and she's in the room, we also, uh, so most of these members are part of the board. Um, and then we have Sarah Kalisle, CEO of Lunny, who has served as uh, my mentor. And she's also the flyer pitch winner from uh, last year, shameless plug, but, uh, <laughs> um, and has been a wonderful mentor. And then I also put there Jordan Lewis, who is our intern from Central State University. So we have a internship program uh, that connects to HBCUs. And so uh, we plan to continue um, doing that. But um, those relationships are basically how we keep this organization together. Um, I also want to mention that my background as an advocate for women of color in the community and the relationships I've had, uh, I've had and have garnered have given me an opportunity to build throughout the community uh, so many transformative experiences and has enhanced my knowledge. But they are also the way that I am able to build an organization that will be sustainable. Um, and while I don't, I'm not gonna sit here and list every single partnership, the connections with people referenced, the partners listed on the screen have been invaluable. And we hope to strengthen those relationships and we currently have, uh, that we currently have, and we hope to continue connecting um, with other organizations. So the Blooming Circle uh, combines uh, two funding models. So there are various funding models that nonprofits can use. And we have combined the heartfelt connector and member motivator with a value-driven cost structure. And so this means that we rely on those who volunteer for the organization, members who sign up for the provider directory, those who uh, are on the board and things like that to share information about the organization but make sure as well to help us fundraise and obtain <coughs> donations. Um, in terms of the cost structure, uh, again, it's value driven and it means that we are committed to investing in that which will assist in providing quality, inclusive and accessible services and programs. We project that our revenue will increase a minimum between 15 and 20% each year beginning in 2024. Um, and our costs uh, are drastically different from uh, 2023 to 2024, but that is because the app development is part of that cost structure. Um, and this is basically to until today. So 72,236 uh, 72, are the altogether the, the total cost and our profit right now is $2,814, but we will increase that, see? Um, but our, our profits correspond with these increases in revenue and costs as we project between a 2.44% and 3% net profit margin for the next three years. So our, our ask, uh, I said a lot, I said some things quickly, some things slowly. But I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the need for funding. So first, thank you for the funding that was provided thus far. Um, we have used that funding to assist with prototype development and to assist with the execution of our Healthy Conversations Brunch. Uh, we also uh, would be remiss if we did not thank Benzila Studios for the branding package that we received. Um, and now because of the relationship, we also have received um, approval to continue with the flyer consulting um, components of the organization in the fall. We are approved for that. So today we are asking for funding and in-kind services related to provider training for a total of 7,500. Um, and uh, that will include marketing, research, and advocacy program development, the smartphone app, an additional $12,500 for consulting, marketing, and participating in a program that uh, Verizon Wireless has created to make sure that internet, uh, wireless service, and things like that are, are accessible. Um, and then adding to the resource directory, making sure that the content is always up to date um, for $5,000. And then the continuation of our internship program through the summer 
Um, and so that's additional 2,000. So before I go to my final slide, I want to remind you to uh, vote for the Blooming Circle. You have until uh, 12 for the Connie Neese Community Choice Award. Follow us on social media, attend our events, volunteer with us, take our state of health access survey by scanning the QR code on the screen. And then to close, allow me to share the words of former First Lady Michelle Obama. Communities and countries and ultimately the world are only as strong as the health of their women. So your investment in the Blooming Circle is not solely for a venture alone. This funding ensures that women of color in the greater Dayton community, me included, continue to survive and to place in and live in a place where we are able to eventually thrive. Thank you. No judges. It's oh, judges. Um, so there are other organizations that could have been on there. Um, I chose uh, specifically one that I know uh, focuses on a more general uh, resource navigation and connection, and so that was the United Way. Um, and I was able to get some other insight because I know, <laughs> I know people who work there. But, uh, and then <laughs> the YWCA, um, because of my own experience working with them uh, and uh, assisting in my past position, um, but also because they use a specific framework that is related to anti-racism and gender empowerment um, and, and really ending violence against women. And so uh, that is a, a major um, component. And, and then the final was Pink Ribbon Good because they they do some of the things that we are hoping to do in the future in terms of providing transportation, uh, in, in terms of resources, um, continuous support groups, um, like smaller support groups, uh, but they don't have specific um, support groups for women of color. Um, I think they are beginning to uh, kind of think through that, uh, but those are, those are why I chose it. But there are tons of other organizations that could be compared. Um, and again, I still don't feel like they're a competition. I actually see them as um, important in how we develop and uh, kind of building relationships with them as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, a home, <laughs> home base, but because we have, uh, and under facilities, it was like utilities, things like that. So internet, because a lot of the work that we do is based on uh, having internet access, having the capacity to, and space, and time really, to do the work of app development, um, website design. I built that, the website and the directory myself. Um, so, yeah, that's a... All right, thank you. So can you talk a little bit about the staffing of the smartphone application? The staffing. Um, so currently, uh, right now, in fact, it's just me building the smartphone um, application. Uh, we do, though, have sponsorship through Microsoft. 
um, and they are providing us temporarily a consultant to assist in the back end design of it. And so, uh, really, in the beginning, I created this prototype, and then I sent it to Microsoft when I found out we got that um, got that assistance. And they were like, mm, "No, no, no, no." So we <laughs> we're working on that, but eventually we would like to hire a consultant that is solely designed or there to make sure that that app is up to date, the functionality is there, um, the advocacy chat line doesn't really have issues with breaking down because that's the most important component. Um, and uh, so really that is, we really would love uh, a consultant for that um, because I have to do everything <laughs> for the organization. And so, um, but that is the staffing um, and eventually perhaps um, other people to do the content development continuously. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about how your program costs, even with personnel, are going down. So um, we have received funding from Premier to put on the brunch series, which right now is the most, uh, outside of the app, mm -hmm. the most expensive uh, uh, thing that is part of our uh, program costs. And so that then takes away from a large portion of that. It, it gives us $5,000 each time that we... Um, but the cost is still there. Yeah, the cost is still, well, the cost is there, um, but app development uh, accounted for $20,000. So, and then again, this was also projected, so... Okay. Um, but the and expectation is growth. Yes, right. the expectation is growth. The thing about the brunch is that that is designed, and we do those quarterly, but those are designed to be kind of intimate, even though 75 is not really intimate, but uh, so going outside of that, right, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Let me spit out this guy. The one person got it right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Perry, nonprofit leader. We have Mr. Thomas Scroggins. So Thomas is going to talk to us about Youth House. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello, hello, hello everyone. My name is Thomas Scroggins and I'm excited to be here today to talk about a nonprofit that is near and dear to my heart. And that nonprofit is Youth House Inc. where we're building youth through community. So really before I get into the bread and butter of our organization, I wanted to give you a quick glimpse at the team and the creatives behind Youth House. So I wanna start off with myself. Once again, I am Thomas Scroggins and I'm the executive director director of Youth House, your favorite executive director. And a little bit about my background. Um, I graduated from Bowling Green State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Social Work. And then I received a, master, excuse me, a Master's of Business Administration from Wright State University. So after I left college, I really worked in the education field for about four to five years as a teacher in a few other positions. Um, I really focused my work around working with youth. Um, once I left the education field, I worked in entrepreneurship and in social entrepreneurship, still working with youth, but creating businesses surrounding being helpful to the community and helping to uplift those who are around me. Um, in addition to my expertise and what I did in education, I also spend most of my time volunteering for youth programs. I was a youth minister. I uh, provided my income or whatever I could to the programs around us because I really want everyone to be successful, especially the programs focusing on developing the youth in our neighborhoods and in our communities. So in addition to myself, I bring with me a team of people who are educators, program developers, people in data management, mostly the people who fill the spots to where I'm not the best in. I might even need to hire her as well to work on my PowerPoints and things. <laughs> she does a great job. But I have a team of people behind me who sort of represent the population of people we're looking to affect. And we really chose this group of people because they bring some skills that is really going to be helpful to us bringing great programming and doing the work of Youth House. So before we really get into what we do as an organization, I thought it was important for you all to understand the journey to Youth House. So if you look at this picture right here, this picture is of a very young me, full of hopes and dreams and untapped potential. And so growing up, I, I had a great childhood, but we also faced some extenuating circumstances. I grew up in a single family household, single parent household, as well as we grew up in poverty in, a, in an area that was impoverished. And so with that come specific challenges. Uh, one thing that we face, and I, even you notice this at a young age, is that there's not a lot of investment in, in communities of color, especially those who are concentrated in poverty. And so even at a young age, these are things that you begin to understand and uh, recognize. If you look at the picture in the middle, that picture is of an older me who began to understand the notion of if something is missing from your community, you have the power and ability to bring it there yourself. So where there was not investment, I decided even at a very young age, high school me, to create programs and to bring investments into my own community. When I thought about young me and me in high school, one thing I wanted to do was learn how to dance and learn that professionally from a teacher or someone who had the ability to really help me to develop that passion. But the issue was there were no programs like that in my immediate community. So all the programs that were available like that were too far out. I couldn't access them because they were too expensive. And there were just a great deal of barriers that prevented me from developing a particular talent that I would have liked to uh, see flourish in, in my life. I wanted to learn how to tap dance. I wanted to learn hip hop in a very grand way and other styles of dance. But I was never able to tap into that specific talent because of the lack of investment in those programs in these communities. So if you look all the way over here, this is a picture of a current day me who takes those experiences and who thinks about young people who look like me in the neighborhoods that I come from and decided to be a part of the bridge makers, those people who are trying to connect young folks to the programs that help to develop them and bring out their best. And so that's why I'm here today and that led to the creation of Youth House. So what I really wanted to do was Youth House itself is the overarching organization. And so under that organization, we have different projects and initiatives that we work on to help develop the youth in our communities. And so what I wanted to bring to you all today is a specific chunk of Youth House, a specific program that we're working on, and I call it Project Youth House. And so there are sort of three main components I want you to understand about Project Youth House. 
So the first component of the component of uh, Project Youth House is we're working to become a resource hub. So we're working to gather together, gather together uh, the right resources to help community organizations as the second chunk of what we're lo looking to do. And then it's all for the purpose of growth and access. So I didn't provide a lot of information about each of those. Next, I'm going to go in and delve deep and explain each aspect of this specific project that I'm looking for funding for today. So the first aspect that I mentioned is becoming a resource hub for organizations. So when I'm talking about a resource hub, there's one particular resource that we know is very important to small organizations within the community, and that is gaining access to space. So when I'm talking about space, it's a very, very important resource. And so what we're looking to do is to create multi-purpose spaces for small organizations within the community to house their program within. So we're not looking to rent out a space for a day or two or for an event. We're looking to create a home, a community of organizations who are working together under the umbrella of Youth House, under uh, one roof or a few small roofs. And so what we're looking to do is to create multi-purpose spaces. In addition to that, we're working to sort of bring into the fold underutilized spaces. So if you think of a great example would be a lot of local churches. They tend to only utilize the space a few days out of the week. So we would look to partner with organizations like this to be able to help them to better utilize the space by bringing other nonprofits or different businesses to utilize um, their unused space during the day. So then the question comes, if you're providing resources, uh, the resource of space, and putting people under one roof, how do you really accomplish that? How do you have multiple organizations operating under one roof? And so one thing that we're looking to do, if you look over here at this picture, is sort of a, a basic representation of using a shift-based model. So when I say a shift-based model, we're basically uh, providing use of the space to the programs we house uh, at certain times of the day. So some organizations can work in the daytime and morning shift, which could be from 8 to uh, 3 p.m. We can have programs operating in the afternoon shift, which can run from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., which is great for after school programs. And then we also have certain programs that we're looking to work with in the night shift, which is rare because there's not a lot of youth programming happening at night, but we have an opportunity to provide um, space for a program to operate in that night shift. So using a shift-based model, it helps us to have multiple organizations running under one roof. Thank you. So in addition to space, I really wanted to single out space because it's one of the highest priorities for us as an organization. But in terms of a resource hub, we want to have a culmination of different resources necessary for these programs to be able to run at full efficiency and at their best capacity. So we want to create a network of additional resources. So I wanted to kind of give a simple um, visual representation of the type of resources we're looking to hobble together under Youth House's roof. So we talk about access to technology being great for these small organizations. So that's laptops and tablets, but also the programming that is required for a lot of these programs to run efficiently. Uh, we want to provide access to transportation on the, youth house, on the youth house. So in the beginning, that could look like small minivans or whatever we can get access to, but we're hoping to build to larger vans and to buses and things like that for the programs we're involved with. We want to work together to get access to funding and to different sources of income that would allow each organization to thrive under Youth House. Um, the picture all the way over here is sort of a, a hodgepodge of different basic equipment that you need in any space. That's your tables, your chairs, your audio equipment. I actually have a small business that will be for providing these resources for free for Youth House and for the organizations to use. So that's just something we're bringing thousands of dollars of equipment already into the organization for um, them to utilize. If you look down here, this is sort of a simple representation of creating a network of individuals. People in the organizations that we're working with, they come with their own expertise. They come with their own connections to people within the community and other organizations. They come with their own income sources, and so we really want to work together to improve every organization under our reach. Uh, the picture down here is sort of a picture of a small kitchen. The kitchen space is really important for us because one of the main things we want to make sure we're providing to youth and the community and the organizations that we surround ourselves with is access to food for the youth and their programming. Um, this is really special and important to us because we know this is one of the big problems facing a lot of people in our community outside of the school day, not having access to healthy and even delicious food. And so that's one thing we want to provide, but also people resources as volunteers and people who to help uh, our organizations to thrive. So overall, that's uh, the resource portion that I mentioned in the beginning. We really want to bring together those resources for utilization by those in Youth House. So the next aspect of Project Youth House that I mentioned earlier was the community organizations piece. I wanted to give sort of an in-depth look of the type of organizations we're looking to work with in Youth House. 
So there are sort of three basic sets of criteria. So the first one is demographics. And so what we're looking for are black and brown led organizations or black and brown being the focus of the organizations that we are working with because we're looking to connect to a specific population of youth. And so we want the board that we work with, we want the organizations that we work with to be representative of the population we're looking to affect. Um, the criteria two, in terms of the organization type, what we really do is we have sort of looser um, looser criteria for the type of organization. So you can be a nonprofit, a for-profit. You can host some type of project or work on some type of an event. What I wanted to do, and I wanted to make this really open because we know when we marry different types of program structures together, we're able to get more accomplished. Nonprofits can accomplish things that for-profits can accomplish and vice versa. And so this is sort of a looser criteria for us. But the third criteria is really the most important aspect of the type of organizations we're looking to work with. And they really need to have some youth component, some youth focus, or a youth project, because that is the, that's really the purpose of what we're trying to do, to create youth development opportunities by partnering with community organizations. So the organizations we work with under Youth House, they really need to fit in each category in order for them to be a priority partner. I'm not saying we won't partner with other organizations, but really for our main focus is to help develop organizations of color who are a nonprofit, for profit, or have some type of great idea within the community who focus on youth development or have projects and things that really make sense for us as Youth House. And sort of the third thing I mentioned about this entire project is sort of goes to the purpose and why we are doing what we're doing with Project Youth House. And that's, it's about growth and access. So really what we're looking to do is to decrease barriers. Specifically, we're looking to decrease the barriers that these organizations out there in the community face. Small black and brown organizations, they have a lot of barriers to their success and their sustainability. So what we're looking to do is to utilize our resources to help sort of curb the issues that they face in growing, increasing their capacity, having a greater impact in the community. And so we really want to provide the resources that decreases their barriers to survival. So we're looking to increase organizational sustainability. So we're looking to help them fill their programs, increase their capacity so that they can bring in the income they need to really host their services, to create jobs, to do the things in the community they're looking to do. But we also know it's important to de decrease costs. So we're providing discounted rents, I mean leases, for the organizations that we're working with. We're doing things to help decrease their costs and increase their income so that ultimately we can increase the quality of their services. So when we increase the quality of their services, services and make them more sustainable, we're able to connect more youth to these organizations and have the impact out in the community that we're looking to have. So we sort of talked about the basic idea, what Youth House is, what we're already working to accomplish. I wanted to now move into some of the important co-creators in our organization. And I mentioned these four because they really serve as a foundation for Youth House for us to be able to stand upon and grow in. Also, these are partners that I've been working with um, that I'm a part of in some capacity before Youth House became an official nonprofit structure. So these are organizations I have put my time, my money, my energy, my expertise into. And so now we're turning it into a, it sort of serves as a co-op of sorts. We're bringing together these different organizations to work together for a similar cause. So I mentioned first Auntie Nina's child care space. They are a licensed local child care space who works particularly with young black and brown children in low income areas. Um, the cost for their services are subsidized by the Montgomery County, and so they represent a great opportunity, particularly because they host a third shift child care program. So this, we, I believe, is really smart to have a program like this at Youth House because it allows us to use the building in a time that most other people don't utilize their building. And it gives us youth programming in a time that most other places don't provide programming. And third shift child care is just missing from this city, missing from most places, but particular, particularly in Dayton. And we have so many factory jobs and families who are working third shifts without great options. So this is an important partner for us. Also, I wanna talk about them for a few other reasons. Uh, and when we look at the finances, you'll kind of see this, but they kind of take on most of the financial burden in our first year of operation because of the length of time that they use the building and um, the type of services they offer. They really help to uphold the organization in our first year before we start adding on additional programs to really help us to grow and to thrive. 
So this is an important partner. Also, I want to mention they give the opportunity for future, future growth. We want to create a preschool program through Youth House. And so this is going to be the partner. We're going to utilize their license to be able to create a, a preschool program. But that's down the road. That's year two. We'll talk about that with the finances. If we look over in the middle, this is an example of a type of after school program that we are working with. This is uh, the Midwest Dayton Blazettes. And so they are a dance team who focuses on mentoring young women through dance and through health. And so this is one of the type of organizations we're trying to work with. I mentioned this because we want a wealth of organizations. We're not just uh, a wealth of after school programming specifically. We don't want to just have one type of after school program because the needs and the issues facing youth um, are vast. And so we want to have different solutions to those problems. Not everyone needs child care, but some people might need an opportunity to develop their skills like maybe I did when I was younger. I want to move over to Auntie Nina's kitchen. Auntie Nina's kitchen is connected to the child care place. They are married together, but they hold different purposes. And so these are separate entities. But Auntie Nina's kitchen serves as our food service provider. And this is really important because we talked about food being one of those core things that we offer the youth in our programming. So they give us the potential to serve each program that we work with with healthy lunches. They also bring partnership with the federal food program, which reimburse programs for providing food to children in certain areas. So there is also um, the opportunity to provide these meals for free. Um, to these organizations. So that is a great resource to be able to have. Um, and the last one I'll mention is RISE. RISE is an after-school program in Dayton who's really been doing great work with helping with homework, with helping with tutoring, with helping with a great deal of services to connect youth to the things that they need to be successful in school. And so these represent sort of the foundation that we're looking to build upon. And they're really representing the organization types that we're looking for. There's nonprofits, for-profits in this space. They have specific youth projects. They're black and brown led. And so this is really representing of what we're looking to work with. So moving on, we sort of talked about what the, what the specific project is we're looking to get housed. We talked about some of the important co-creators. Thank you, because I missed that. Oh, Jesus. Okay, let's see the backup. It's always great to have a backup. And I'll move it forward pretty quickly. Um, we'll talk about the financial projections next. Um, what I did was, and it's freezing again. And what I did was I created sort of a, a comparison between the income and expenses for our first five years as an organization. Now, to be fair, we are an organization in its infancy stages, and so these are really financial projections based on the programs that we're looking to work with and the things we're looking to do in the future. And so I want to point out a few things, and I'm going to allow you to ask me questions about this uh, a little later on. But you'll notice from year one to year two, there is a large jump in income and expenses, and that'll be explained as we kind of move forward. Um, and then for year three, four, and five, uh, there are smaller, more incremental changes. And so I just wanted to point that out because I know those are questions that you all will have. So what I wanted to do was I'm going to talk mostly about year one and year two. So year one, in terms of an income breakdown, there are three income categories that we have. And that's leasing, that's our grant goals, and that's donations and fundraisers. And so for time purposes, I just want to mention that um, the leasing is an important one. We have three after-school programs. If they bring in $300 a month, um, that's $900. And our child care partner, like we said, uh, brings in about $1,500 because of how they use the space. We have a grant goal. So this is what we're looking to raise based on our experience, based on who we have on our board. It's really a goal for us. And then in terms of donations and fundraising, this is just a hodgepodge of all the little things we're doing to raise money for the organization. So this pitch contest is a great area to, to uh, get access to funds. Our board is donating money each month uh, to get us to the $1,800 goal, program donations, all for a uh, yearly income for this year of $36,000. So in terms of, can you, thank you. Uh, in terms of year one expenses, uh, we put in the startup costs. We received $1,500 from the first few, few rounds of this organization and actually helped us to bring Youth House to life. And so we were able to get our 501c3 application completed in the end. And we actually got it back pretty quickly. Uh, our logo and all of the basic things of creating a structure we were able to do with the funding from this. But then I want to mention the monthly costs. What we're looking to do for our first space is to utilize a residential space. And so we want to do that because it gives us the space and the separation we need to create multi-purpose spaces, but also the costs are a little lower than a, um, leasing a commercial space. And so we sort of did sort of a median rent and utilities amounts, but we also allocated money for services and resources. And this is basically all the little things that you need to do to have your organization or that space being able to run efficiently, all for yearly costs of about $22,500. And both of those income and breakdown expenses were based on a July, June, July 
June and July to December format because that's when we're looking to really start bringing in these the income from these programs and getting us all in one spaces in the June July timeline so that's why those numbers look like they do and very quickly I'm just going to mention one thing for year two income breakdown this is where you saw the great jump from the 36,000 to the 142,000 income mark and that was based on addition uh, an additional type of income category and that is direct programming and year two I mentioned us wanting to bring on a preschool program and so the numbers you see here are actual numbers these are the actual numbers that come from the county on what they pay for for youth so we found a, an average which is a six hundred dollars our food program that we mentioned it brings in about six hundred dollars for those same six kids and then Ohio Department of Education funding because as a preschool program will have access to this fund so we bring all of these numbers together to bring in about six thousand dollars a month and for the year 74,000 so this represents that big jump from the uh, 36,000 to the higher number and then the other categories we either uh, we did an incremental increase in what we're looking to raise in terms of our grants but also uh, donation, donations and fundraisers and we added a few more programs for our leasing one small thing I'm going to mention for the cost breakdown, these are very similar to last year's because we would be utilizing the same space, but we added sort of what we call a plus expansion add-on. So this is additional funding that we want to budget, put in the budget to represent if we're able to get access and partner with a church or a space that gives us a low cost um, entry into their organization and to being able to rent their space. So we added that on as a monthly cost and we also increased services and things like that. Also, I want to note that for year two, it includes personnel costs. Year one did not include personnel costs. For this year, we really are working on a volunteer basis. And so me, even as the executive director, I'm not taking a salary this year, but in year two, I'm looking to uh, start receiving just a base salary for the work that I've been doing. Um, I've really been working 24 hour days <laughs> for free, but I'm going to do what I have to do to get this organization where I need it to go. So we added the cost um, breakdown and it, for our personnel because we had a uh, preschool program too. We added some additional funding for two part-time teachers or one full-time teacher for that program so that represents our yearly cost and I'm not going to get into year three to five this these years we did a 10% increase both in income and costs to sort of rec uh, represent incremental change for each year and so you can kind of see each year there's a 10% bump in both income and cost because this these three years are about us filling all of our programs to capacity and uh, just incrementally being able to grow as an organization so I just want to say we talked about the finances, we talked about a lot of things, but it's all about the reason that I'm here. And it's for young people like me in the neighborhoods that I come from, not having access to the programming that, need, that they needed to become their best selves. And I want to be a part of bridging the gap and providing access to these organizations and providing access to the funding and investing in my own community. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here before you today to talk about a program that is near and dear to my heart. Um, you, can con you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Sorry, some things didn't translate when I downloaded it from our online platform. Um, you can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, and our email. But also, if you want to vote for us for the Kindly Niche Community Choice Award, I have a, a QR code over here. I want to end off with any questions. Um, that's a great question. That's something my mentor always uh, talked to me a, a bit about, the costs associated with that marketing, things like that. In terms of marketing, the beautiful thing about working with self-run organizations, we're not starting these organizations. We're working with organizations that are already out in the community working. That provides us access to their youth populations, and that provides us access to free marketing because they're talking and sharing the information about Youth House and what we're doing. And so that's one example of marketing. But we're also being very um, intentional about being present at all the community events that we can get, uh, that we can be present at. So we're we're out there, I'm, I'm the one cost and you know, I'm free, so uh, we're out there at these community events talking about our program, what we're looking to do. But we also are trying to get involved with referral systems as well and connecting to communities of care. I actually met yesterday with an organization called Unite Us. Um, it's an organization that will be launching in Dayton. They've already launched all around Ohio, but they'll be launching in Dayton and I want to connect you to them as well. They're looking for organizations like us or organizations to become part of a continuum of care. So they're putting us in, our, in their system and they're connecting us with larger 
organizations. They're connecting us with different populations, but they also have an excellent referral system. So they'll be sending their clients to our organization when they have the need um, that we can feel, because we have a few different programs. Uh, we have after school programs, we have stuff like that, but we also have smaller youth support activities like care packages that have hygiene um, items for young people in their family. So they're connecting their populations of people. So this is hospitals and Omega CDC and all of these large organizations are part of this uh, continuum of care that we're using and it provides an excellent free marketing tool for us. So those are just some examples. And so what we're focusing more on are the freer, even though it really does cost, it costs time, it costs, you know, uh, the information that we want to showcase at those events. Those cost money, but those are minimum costs that we're looking to have provided through um, the income that we bring in from our activities. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really always hit the, the money because mm -hmm. um, for organizations that serve our community, this is our, usually our, our weakest spot for mm -hmm. our, our sustainability. So first, kudos for giving yourself a salary. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, my concern is that some of those grants, and I know them, mm -hmm. especially the food grant, uh, takes a lot of compliance work. Mm -hmm. My concern right. is that you don't have that in food as a line item, which I think is going to be big, especially with the increases around food. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think it's going to stop just because of the shortage, right. and, you know, supply shortage. But secondly, the compliance structure on the end. Mm -hmm. You being a single person, um, are not going to be able to do it all. Physically show up to mm -hmm. market, do all this work, do the grants, do the asking, I hear you, I see you have some people, and do the compliance that's needed for a federal program. Right. Um, that may be a gap, or you may be able to speak to it. Um, yes. I would love for you to be able to speak to that. And then finally, um, I'll ask one more now, I'll stop is that you have the cost, uh, kind of 21,000 breakdown per year but you don't have it in income in that exact same way. Uh, my question to you with that is that <coughs> donations and fundraising will take some physical face-to-face -face energy, right. including writing mm -hmm. at the end. Talk to me about that year-to-year -year investment. So both of those, compliance, okay, yeah. I, got, I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I got you. Okay. The compliance, right, which is gonna take some, some writing, mm -hmm. evaluation, assessment of what I've asked or procured, and then how to keep that going year after year after year. That, there's a cost to your time and energy. Right. So that, that's really great questions. I want to speak to the compliance and dealing with food and different things like that. When I mentioned sort of my expertise and my work in the, the uh, social entrepreneurial space. One of the spaces that I work directly with is the child care program. Mm -hmm. um, working specifically with Auntie Nina's to where I have four to five experiences working on making sure that that organization is in compliance. Um, it's an organization that I run myself. And so I have the experience of working with that federal food program. These are actual numbers um, that I bring to the table right now. Um, in terms of compliance, we're a highly rated program. We're a four star will go to five stars once you do just one small one small item but we're a highly um, highly starred uh, program and so I think that that experience should speak to being able to house and keep up with the expectations of the county I just had an inspection um, two days ago for that organization mm -hmm. and I get accolades from those inspectors who, who look at us as one of their best in terms of the uh, child care spaces that they work with. So my experience allows me to be able to keep up with those things. But in addition to that, each organization, what we do is we provide the foundation. I have the expertise of how to operate the food program. Mm -hmm. I can give those programs that we are working with uh, an easy breakdown to how to be in compliance with those organizations, how to structure things, how to structure the menus, what milk and stuff they're supposed to use. This this is my day-to-day -day work outside of Youth House. Uh, so so I, I'm an expert in that space. I do that well, and I can provide a, a dis, not a discounted, but uh, easy template for the other organizations that want to utilize those specific services. So each of those things that I talk about, I have experience with. Uh, in terms of the breakdown of cost and income, um, there is sort of a year, uh, a month difference. One says June, one says yeah. July. Yeah. Well, I, I started off, I wanted to increase the cost a little bit. So I think we'll, we'll get more costs before we get the income for those spaces because you already have to down payment, not down payment, that's if we're able to um, find a particular lease that allows us to buy the space. But there are costs that happen before the income of those spaces happen. So I kind of just did a one month bump out of our costs to sort of increase those to go for um, our 
uh, rent for the first month. And so it's just a small little bump from a uh, month bump for we, we experience expenses first and then we experience income. And those numbers, once again, are really based on the data. I'm, I'm, I'm in uh, real estate. That's one of those spaces I'm in as well. I'm always looking at what's on the market, the rents and different things like that. So these are really numbers that come from my personal experience as an investor in all those different spaces. So that's why I did the numbers like I did. And it's from June and July because we're looking to experience those costs. Not right now. We're looking to experience those in the next few months when we get access to the residential space we're supposed to use. Sorry. I don't know if that answered all of your questions. But if you want me to add on anything, just let me know. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Touching it? Oh, it's me touching it. I just want to make sure it's. This was, it was off. Oh. 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 Allow the judges to tabulate their scores. You did, yeah. Thomas did. Is okay. Good morning and happy Earth Day. This is so great to talk to you about Turtle Up on Earth Day. Turtle Up is about education, conservation, and transformation. I'm Corinne, founder of Turtle Up. And what we aim to do is to conserve and preserve Ghana's sea turtle by using a community approach. And we also aim to address two problems. Problem number one, our sea turtles are sick. They are threatened by extension because of climate change, pollution, development, and poachers. Meet Dorothy. Dorothy suffers from tumors caused by pollution. I want to help Dorothy. And I know a lot of people want to help the Dorothys of this world. 
It's important to conserve and preserve our sea turtles because for over 120 million years, they have helped our environment on Earth <coughs> and in the ocean. Did you know, for example, that when they come lay their eggs, they feed the sand and our dunes, hence helping to prevent land erosion, or that they help to maintain healthy coral reef, and also the growth and propagation of sea grasses. So when you support Turtle Up, you're not only supporting our sea turtles, you're supporting our ecosystems on land and in the ocean. Problem number two. The current program, study abroad programs, are not meeting the needs of our Gen Z students. That is because we all know that Gen Z students are different they are influencers and change makers, and they are really interested in the environment and the impact of humankind on the environment. For them, it is Earth Day every day. And in fact, 78% of them says that they are increasingly concerned about climate change and the environment. So let's look at their traveling patterns. They spend an average nine, 29 days traveling per year. 72% say they want to splurge on a big trip in 2024 to make up for the time they lost during the pandemic. 51% of them say they want to go internationally and 65% of them want a unique experience. And that is why they're willing to pay a little more if they have to for eco trip to have conservation uh, experience. So our solution, we are bridging the gap between the need to conserve and preserve our sea turtles and the needs and desire of our Gen Z students to have meaningful study abroad programs. We're offering eco trip for students. Those eco trips are immersive and they are credit bearing. And we're going to New Ningo Pram Pram in Ghana, which is home of the largest sea turtle hatchery in the country. So in essence, our two problems are solving each other. And our solution is sustainable and financially sound because students pay for their trips. And the excess income from those trips go back to our mission, which is to conserve and preserve sea turtles. So we are impacting the planet and the people. Look at the industry. The tourism and ecotourism industries are multi-billion dollars industry. And in Ghana, it's also a booming industry because Ghana is one of the safest countries in Africa and it's beautiful, welcoming to people and businesses. And I'll take you there in a moment. Our customers are our Gen Z students. Um, they make up for 20% of our US population, 32% of our global population. We also um, have to talk to the parents the study abroad administrators and donors. Donors for several reasons, one of which we want to fundraise for full scholarship so that under-resourced students who would not be able to afford that kind of trip can go and have that great experience. To validate our market, we surveyed 133 students at UD and almost 76% of them said they would like to go on an eco trip to Ghana. The reasons for that is they want to improve their cultural competency and they want to work on pro conservation projects. We also um, surveyed the parents and asked if they would send their students to that kind of trip. And they said they would uh, for the same reasons, improving the cultural competency and uh, work on s environmental sustainability. So our value proposition is directly connected to our customers, the Gen Z's, their parents, the study abroad administrators, and the donors. Our students will work hands-on on sea turtle conservation with local staff at the hatchery and with the local community. They will engage with the local community members daily. Our competition to this point is really other study abroad programs at UD. And although we are comparable in prices, the, pro the programs that are existing right now, the students go places and see places, but they do not have a direct impact on the environment 
and they do not have daily interaction with local community members. And that is why I'm saying the study abroad do not meet the needs of the Gen Z students. We have other competitors, and I call them distant competitors. Um, for example, in Rwanda, um, I was fortunate a few years ago to go see the silverback gorillas, another species threatened by extension. And in that model, that was not for students, that was not credit bearing, and that was not immersive. But what that model did for Turtle Up is it validated the model. In that model, the poachers became the tour guides. And so that's a former poacher. He took us around for two hours in the cultural village, and the next day we went on a trek to see the gorillas. And so the money the tourists paid was to educate us about the gorillas, and to conserve, obviously, the gorillas, but also to provide jobs so that the poachers didn't have to poach the gorillas anymore. So we come back for a circle. Another country that has really um, put the emphasis on protecting their environment and, and tourism to protect the environment is Costa Rica. I was fortunate to meet with the former president of Costa Rica a couple of weeks ago, President Carlos Alvarado. And he shared with me how the country has changed from early 2000, when the country was plagued by hyperinflation, riots, deforestation, and it was a developing country, to today, it's a middle-income country where the tourism industry is booming, and that uh, money goes back to environment and conservation. So again, those two countries have validated our model. So I'm telling you. Ghana is the next Costa Rica. It has the potential to be the next Costa Rica. We've looked at um, validating our customers, validated the model. Let's look how we are different. We have the first mover advantage. We are among the first in the nations to offer eco trip for students. We are the first to offer eco trip for students that are credit bearing and immersive. We are the first to offer those trips that is around sea turtle conservation, and the first to do that in Ghana. We are also the first to offer full scholarship for under-resourced students. So let's go to Ghana. Akwaba, welcome. Ghana is in West Africa. It's very rich in resources, beautiful. Many, many cultural sites. Let's go now to New Ningo Pram Pram. Again, home of the largest sea turtle hatchery. This is the capital city of Accra. New Ningo is right here, 45 minutes away. This is the hotel in which we would be staying. And that is the hatchery within the hotel, particularly right here. And so students can go hands-on having and safely do um, work with the turtles. Some of the activities we will be going doing those trips is uh, the Slave Castle, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois Museum, the Kakum National Park, and Krumah First President Museum, and uh, Boti Falls, and of course, daily hands-on work with the sea turtles. The way we're going to market with this is through our own website, and then the study abroad, our partners website. We're also doing social media, email. Earn Media is, has become kind of big in the last few weeks. I was actually on Good Morning Dayton this past Tuesday. Um, we're doing presentation in different organizations and, and uh, universities and high schools and mini courses. I'm developing mini courses. Those are free for students, free of charge, but they are credit bearing. And so we are adding that as a way to market as well. We have three sources of revenues, the trips, sales, and right now the estimated uh, excess income per trip per student is 1250. We have donations and sponsorships and grants. We already applied for two, waiting to hear for the outcome of those. Financial projections. Um, this year, they, we just started, so we are um, focusing on fundraising. We friend raise in the fall. We are going to kick off fundraising May 23rd because it's World Turtle Day. 
Um, and then in 24, we'll have fundraising, continuing, and then one trip. 25, two trips. 26, four, and 27, six trips. And at that point, we have four schol full scholarship and 12 full scholarship for under-resourced students. So the impact. We have a twofold impact, the planet and the people. Well, we also have an intercontinental impact, Dayton and Ghana. So let's talk about the planet. There is no planet B. It's everyone's responsibility to work on our environment. And one way to do that is to conserve and preserve our sea turtles because of what they do for the environment. So that's what we're going to do at Turtle Up. We're going to increase the number of mothers saved. We're going to increase the number of hatchling safely released, increase the number of eggs collected, and also inject money into conservation efforts and research. The impact on people, it's all about education. We want to educate people so that they become global citizens, not only on an environmental perspective, but on a human perspective. And so our students will come back more culturally competent. They'll be able to understand, interact, and respect people from other cultures. And that's going to make them more marketable on the global market, whether they work locally or internationally. They, know they need those soft skills. Our demographics are changing constantly. Finally, we are giving them a product that they're asking for. We are allowing them to um, enhance their cultural competency and work on conservation. The impact on Dayton. Well, when our students are coming back, they're going to go to PK-12 schools and they're going to become influencers and ambassadors sharing their learnings about the culture and their learnings about sea turtles and their habitats. They're, we're also going to provide full scholarships so that undersourced Daytonians can go on these trips with us and participate in the experience. Finally, we think that Turtle Up is quite unique and innovative and that it will add to the reputation of UD but also to Dayton because Turtle Up has the potential to be the gold standard for eco trips for students. In Ghana, we're going to educate the locals so that they understand the enormous uh, need for sea turtles to conserve our environment. And they will also um, learn and gain some cultural competency because they'll interact with us from all different cultures. And we will create jobs, also creating jobs uh, in Dayton. So Nelson Mandela said it best. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that's what we're going to do. We have been busy since the start of this competition. And we thank you so much for your feedback and the monies. We have used the money to um, register with the state in late January. We also did our filing for 501c3. We use the money to uh, create a website, totalab.org, and to create a new logo and start some work on branding. We've also developed two very strong and experienced boards. We connected with conservancy groups. I belong to many networks now with many experts. And we have partnership with Uprice Travel, which is a travel agency located in the States and in Ghana. Um, and uh, vetted. We um, also establish relationship with Miami Valley School, that's a high school, and they want an immersive program in 2025. And we recently engaged two interns. Um, we also been accepting for flyer consulting uh, for next fall, so thank you for that. Thanks to um, this, we also created a bus uh, business plan which involved the fundraising and marketing plan as well. Where we're going? We are still in our startup phase. Uh, we are developing the curricula right now and negotiating contracts. Again, we are raising funds starting in May for World Turtle Day. We have an event organized. You'll all be invited. I hope you come. In 24, we'll have one first trip. 
in 25 two trips, one with Miami Valley and one with UD. Um, and this is where we are going to reassess if we want to add our website sales as an additional source of revenue. That's a little complicated because we have to account for quality, shipping, inventory. So we are letting that be for now. And that was one of your feedback. So thank you. Uh, in 26, four trips. And we're going to investigate the possibility of having college credit for high school students. And 27, six trips. And uh, we have our eyes on seven acres of land on the beach in New Ningo Pram Pram. So that land gains value uh, by the day. Our team, I'm Corinne. I'm a professor at UD. I teach intercultural proficiency courses and leadership. I have worked for six years in Ghana. My husband is Ghanaian. My family lives in New Ningo Pram Pram, uh, where the hatchery is. And um, I have, in my past institution or past life, I would say, I've organized trips for students to Sri Lanka and Israel and went with them and uh, study abroad programs. So for me, Turtle Up is my passion project because it represents the culmination of my professional and personal experiences. The rest of the board is extremely talented and skilled. We have D. There is from Ghana, professor in international entrepreneurship at Kentucky, uh, Northern Kentucky, Tony Kim. Paula is, um, she is a fundraiser. She has fundraised $17 million uh, in San Diego for our former institution. And so she's, she's ready. She's in the, in the starter, uh, ready to kick off this campaign. So we ask for your feedback and donations. Um, we ask that if you know board members or you want to be on the board, please uh, come and join us. And then with the pitch money, we will continue to work on our website. We will continue our branding work. We also want to protect our intellectual property. We want to consult for marketing and event organizing. And finally, some will go to travel expenses so we can finish the business activities in Ghana for our first trip. So let's turtle up. Thank you. I'll give you one. Too. And obviously, you you moved the mission in a way that's 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 really concrete. So I can I can see it really well. I, I think my gap um, is that it it feels that when we're talking about uh, the goals around an ecosystem and creating a pathway for our Gen Zs to know more and to engage more, um, it seems to be hyper focused on those communities that already have that in some way. UD students are there that are out of all of our all of our colleges that are within space are some are, are, are privileged in comparison. Um, just recently, in fact, uh, has been a push around more diversity within the student base. Uh, secondly, is that Miami Valley School are the most privileged of students. And so as I'm thinking about the goals which I like, what I don't see is the penetration into Dayton's community that this, I think, would be the most impactful. Mm -hmm. Sure. So can you talk to me about that? Sure, absolutely. So we have to start. And uh, we are starting with the communities that I'm in and I'm engaged with the students at UD. Now, they are not all privileged at UD. There's a lot of scholarship going around. Um, and so our first trip is going to be with them, but that's a, with our fundraising going along and our income from the first trip, that is going to quickly kick in some uh, full scholarship for our under-resourced Daytonian students. So I think that scholarship component, I mean, giving 12, and it perhaps will be more, uh, because in the financing, uh, in the financials, if you saw, 
there's uh, profits uh, pretty much immediately as soon as we have trips and donations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then there's also um, a cash out and that cash out goes into escrow mm -hmm. to perhaps uh, we have to buy a car in Ghana perhaps or the land. Mm -hmm. That can also go more for scholarships. So we have, that's what I teach. That's what I'm passionate about. It's mm -hmm. serving the underserved communities. Mm -hmm. So that's the case of New Ningo. That's what I teach in my classes. That's my passion. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really ultimately we'll have more scholarship for those students. And also, um, you know, Miami has an interest. And so why not? Mm -hmm. um, but we need that first income to then push back mm -hmm. to the scholarships, if that makes any sense. It, it actually, we, need, yes. we need to start yes. somewhere in, able, yes. in, in order to help the ones that would need that financial support. We need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. yeah, thank you. I think that's a very powerful question. And that's really what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. okay. We don't need, know each other, but that, that is my goal in life. You don't have to take it, but I would encourage that if you're thinking about taking about a population of 20 students and they're coming from UD, which makes sense. I, I want to be clear about that. Uh, that maybe it could also be 10 at UD and uh, 10 from Central State. Absolutely. Right. And in fact, yeah. in, the, in the business plan, I think you saw that, that we're going to penetrate the other university, and there are so many right around here. Yeah. And so we are, uh, Central State is right in our um, yeah, yeah. vision. And for me, the more interdisciplinary, the better. So in interdisciplinary in disciplines, yeah. interdisciplinary in where we come from as human yeah. beings, yeah. because that's how we learn those cultural competencies. So all of that is uh, definitely the direction we're going. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank and you, Karen, I just want to say other point. One more point, and I'm done. I'm done. You all, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. I want to say that. And although that, again, I, I appreciate you talking about, and I, I want to make sure I'm saying this right too, that the privilege at UD is that the privilege of you going into the resource, a resourced school. I want to make sure I'm not talking about people's personal uh, bank account. Because even with those other colleges like a CSU, a Central State, I promise you, you'll have people that can pay that entire sure, amount, right? Sure. Because the diversity of the sure. right, of what we're trying to do around the yeah, um, ecosystem is important. So. Sure. Okay, thanks. I'm all about giving opportunities for people that don't have it, like many of my colleagues. Um, so it's not just about uh, social economic. It's not so. It, it's just. All kinds. It's all about education. I, I'm an educator. I've been an educator my whole life. So I want to educate everybody. Well, we still have six minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, listen okay. here. I get to talk to six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you want six minutes? <laughs> Shannon has the floor. <laughs> Go, <laughs> girl. Uh, sweet. Lean in, lean in the Come Let's see. Um, so it sounds like that's home for you um, in, in um, Ghana, and that you also have um, some other perspective that I, I really, you said it quickly, but I, I thought was really interesting that is informing your perspective, right? The other part of the of a, uh, sea turtle is your passion, but you've talked about. Right, the gorillas, gorillas, you talked about going to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. which is, uh, so a, as you're moving through <coughs> space and you're informing your space, are all things around <coughs> animals, the ecosystem, environment, so for instance, as you go to Sri Lanka, hey, can you talk a little bit about uh, that, that kind of cross-section of um, um, information? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so in Sri Lanka, I was uh, leading students, my leadership students at the time, <coughs> to look at different model of leaderships. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in our books, you know, it says one thing, but when you go to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. it's really community leadership. Mm -hmm. That's what it is in Ghana too. And there we did, it was not so much about the environment, although it's <coughs> always a little bit about the environment, but it was about <coughs> service, le service learning. Um, and so we worked with the villagers to build them a community center. Mm -hmm. And so, 
what I've seen at that time was really um, I open eye opening for me, but not surprising. Is students, you know, like masters, PhD students, going on those trips and. And uh, in Sri Lanka, in the culture over there, when they do that, it means yes. And so people would make fun of that. I would, in the bus, I would hear the giggling and the fun comments. And, uh, but what I've seen on day seven is a total transformation. The students were, um, they were crying. They didn't want to leave. Like, it, they really started to understand the culture and to gain so much knowledge from it. Um, and so that convinced me that, you know, those programs are really important at all levels, undergrad, grad, whenever, students, non-students, because it shapes us as human beings that interact with other human beings and cultures. I don't know if that answers your question. Sure. You have crime statistics um, slides. Can you talk to us about why you... Yeah, thank you that? for asking. Sure. So, um, well... Um, you know, I, I think it's important to relate the safety of this country. It's far, and um, the, study, the study abroad programs at UD are in Japan and Chile, and people go all over the place, right? Um, but in terms of safety, I thought it was important to show you, uh, in case you were asking, is Ghana safe? The answer is yes. In fact, it's safer than the United States. Um, it's also safer to Chile and Costa Rica that we just talked about, or Kenya, all locations that UD sends students to, um, and other uh, study abroad programs. So, do you want to know specifics about that, or? No, I, I believe that is safe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe. <laughs> I just had a quick question, kind of on when you're planning to um, run these trips, just because I, I see it's a 13-day stay, and I know kind of from the student perspective, uh, depending on when it is in the year, you're going to get a lower amount of students if you do it kind of mid-summer, people are doing internships towards the end of, year, of the year or a semester, if you're doing kind of a mini course leading up to it. Those are some of the busiest times for students, making it a little bit more difficult to take a 13-day stint. Kind of what, what's the timeline looking like in terms of... Sure. So remember I spoke about uh, serving 133 students? And so they spoke about, they were kind of, we just want to go. So whether it's summer, spring break, or winter break, we just want to go. But I was thinking, and again, it depends uh, which class we partner with, um, but I was thinking winter uh, intercession after Christmas. So if they celebrate, they might um, come after. Um, there's also spring break um, possibilities and different institutions, like I was saying, penetrating other institutions of different spring breaks and winter break and startup of the year. So I think as we grow, we can easily stack those up. somewhere, but it seems like either one of these could be their own nonprofit organizations, and so just hoping you mm -hmm. take that into consideration. I, I understand some of the concern here is how much is taken benefiting, mm -hmm. but you could build a nonprofit just around ecotourism, and are you doing enough, is there enough being built enough to, to actually save the turtles? That, that, that's, I mean, so that's, that, that's more, if you want to address that, that's fine, but it's just... Uh, yeah, I think I'd like to address that. Um, I, I, I'm not mad or anything, I'm just... No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and I'm not either, I'm thankful. Um, I, I absolutely know we're going to do this. The reason, because... So my board is amazing and I'm still recruiting. I'm recruiting strategically, okay? And I also um, have an amazing advisory board. The top sea turtle experts in the world are on my advisory board. And so when it comes to the conservancy piece, and in Ghana, Professor Andrew is top notch. Everybody knows him in the world. So, you know, we'll work with the community. That's the community approach. And so 
I'll defer to them what they, you know, together will decide what they need and, and what that looks like. Um, in terms of the education of our students uh, at UD and beyond, I'm an educator and I've done it. And again, I'm surrounding people with people that have done it, that are top notch in their own fields and capacities. So I have no doubt we're going to do it. But I'm always welcoming for feedback. Always. So there's almost like you have three opportunities. You've got a sutural opportunity, you've got an ecotourism opportunity, and the third is sort of that uh, connection for those. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, some, some of it is you've got to get the first few pieces in place. Mm -hmm. Kudos for yeah. all the development over the last six months. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to your feedback and a lot of sleepless night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll take that back because I use it for class. So, a moment to tabulate their results and give to Colton. And next, we will have the well. So, we'll get prepped up and be back in about a minute. I know. Yeah, your last question. No, your last question. Your question was like, I mean, this is what I was going to ask, but you go. <laughs> So this is our final presentation today for the nonprofit track. We have Ms. Kelsey with the well. I would like to start off with a little story. So I'm going to tell you about Angie. Angie is one of our clients, um, and Angie actually lives in Pittsburgh. So she had a baby last fall, um, and after that, uh, they figured out that the baby had a tongue tie, so had to have a quick little procedure. Um, but afterwards, the baby was inconsolable for days, um, wouldn't nurse, wouldn't latch, um, and she knew something was wrong. So Angie uh, went to her pediatrician. She went to her lactation consultant. Um, all in different spaces, right? She went back to the dentist who did the procedure, um, and Angie was getting the same answer. Your baby's fine, your baby's just colicky, but she didn't wanna leave it at that. Um, so she got online, she did some Googling, and she stumbled upon the well, um, and she gave us a call. Um, the next day, she was in her car, and she drove from Pittsburgh to come to Dayton for three days. So she stays in an Airbnb. We get her set up with a care plan when she walks in the door. So she is able to get a massage in-house because she is super tense. We're able to do some craniosacral therapy on her baby. We ended up having to do a um, second tongue tie because the procedure was done incorrectly, as she suspected. Um, and then we were able to do some suck therapy at the end to make sure that when they left, they were both literally good as new. 
Um, so that is like a bow on top. That is what we do at the well. We are a community of like-minded practitioners all under one roof who collaborate to ensure our clients receive only the best care. Uh, we pride ourselves on our ability to really root cause issues and that builds really high trust with our clients pretty quickly. That plus the community that we form within our workshops and the events in-house means that our clients have a um, really great relationship with us when they walk through that front door. So I'm Kelsey. I have been volunteering with The Well uh, since last summer. Um, I am a UD Anna Flyer Enterprises alumni, and so this pitch is extra special to me. Um, on top of that, I'm a mom, if you haven't heard. <laughs> um, I had a, my third is back in the back, and he's been yelling pretty much the entire time. Um, but he was born just a couple of days before the last pitch, so I wasn't able to be here then. Um, but um, that's a little bit of why this, uh, this business is so important to me. Um, so um, I guess the last piece I want to share before we kick off is the most unique piece about the well is that we are we're a nonprofit. We have a um, scholarship fund. So not only are we a healthcare model, but we also have a scholarship fund to be able to support those who just need a little bit of help. Um, those like Angie, we were able to actually use our fund to put her up in a Airbnb um, to make the trip that much less stressful for her. Um, so that's just a great example of what we what we do at the well. So I'm going to kick off and um, I want to start with um, how excited we are. Oh, looks like we're a little cut off. Bear with us. Um, so um, I want to share how excited I am. When I first started working at the well, um, I very quickly realized that we needed to make some changes. We were growing super fast. Um, we opened our doors in August of last year, and by October, some of our practitioners' intake had nearly tripled. Um, so we're growing really fast. We don't have the infrastructure set up to be able to maintain this, and we definitely don't have the resources. So when I first started getting involved, I knew I needed to figure out how to make us profit so that way we would be able to afford a staff. I had no idea how to do that. Um, so I, uh, with my experience with uh, UD, um, I knew that this was a really great opportunity for us to get that mentoring to be able to figure out the answers. And I'm really excited we have. So we're going to talk through a few of our tactics. Our goals are sustainability, um, building that client loyalty, and growth. And all of our tactics will fit within those goals, which is pretty great. Um, and I'm really proud to share that um, we are growing. Not only that, in 2024, with these tactics, we will be able to afford a small staff. So first, I want to talk about practitioner responsibility. Um, there are two big tactics here under this bucket. So first, our current practices um, are, were kind of formed on the fly, right? We're growing so fast, the need was so large in our community that we had to throw some things together. And I'm the first to admit that they probably weren't as crisp as what they needed to be. So looking at rent, um, that was our first tactic. By going back um, and right-sizing to make sure that we are consistent across the board based on office space, um, as well as filling two additional offices that we have in-house, um, we are going to be able to, <clears throat> excuse me, to increase um, our rent by around twenty-five thousand dollars starting in twenty twenty-four. On top of that, I want to talk about um, what where things are coming from at this point. So um, right now, the founder um, is pocketing is is providing a lot out of her own pocket. Um, so she is not only giving of unlimited time. She's mentoring, um, she's sourcing, she's finding these wonderful practitioners to join the business. She's running the business herself. Um, she is sharing referrals, but she's also paying for a lot. She's paying for the website, she's paying for the brand, she's paying for things like cleaning. Um, and uh, then we have the practitioners on the other end who are coming in and enjoying all of these rewards. So um, starting in 2024, we will also be um, using something I've called an administrative fee. Um, which will be $75 per office per month for each practitioner. And that fee will then go to help cover um, and offset some of these costs. Um, so that's right around $8,000 a year, which that plus around 25, that feels really, really solid about some ways that we can start to be able to cover some additional support. 
The best part of this is I do want to share, we, um, the practitioners that we house in the well, they are small owned businesses. Most of them, this is their first um, time being solo. Um, they've left their uh, pediatrician's office. They're um, out of school. They're running their own phys um, physical therapy office. And so we've given them what is it, April? So what, like seven or eight months heads up so that way they can start to plan for these things and they're all on board and ready to do so. Next, I want to talk about our client membership uh, program. So um, I want you to picture this like massive network um, of loyal fans, I'm going to say. So we have this uh, experience of 20 years in the Dayton area, um, and a lot of people are connected to the people who are um, working with us at the well. Um, so these people um, are super excited about what we're doing. They're super um, invested in our success as well. Um, but they also, you know, they're moms like me. They're um, going through different stages of life, and they have lots of questions. So currently, um, we are getting text messages to various practitioners 20 hours a day with lots of questions and lots of needs, and can I have this appointment, and can you squeeze me in here? Um, and so our client membership program is a way to um, give a little bit of profit to some of our current practices. Um, so after pulling some, um, we have decided to break this out into separate tiers. So we would have a tier one, um, which would include unlimited text between business hours. Um, and then you can see the details from here on. Um, so this system um, would not only organize us a little bit better, imagine now these messages going into one phone that is manned by an administrator who then can divvy up based on ownership um, and it's also going to draw a little bit of boundaries. So a lot of what we are facing right now is um, a lot of women running a million miles a minute, unable to slow down or turn off their phone, and how do you not respond at 3 a.m. when a mom is panicked saying, my baby won't latch and hasn't eaten in eight hours. Um, so this will draw those boundaries as well as get us organized and help keep um, our clients loyal at the same time. All right, and now I want to talk a little bit about our growth strategy. So I want to tell you another story about Jocelyn. Jocelyn is one of our doulas, and she is a doula as a birth coach, for those who aren't aware. Um, and Jocelyn <laughs> lives and serves in Avondale, which is um, near Cincinnati. And Avondale is one of the poorest communities in the state of Ohio. So Jocelyn, um, she's amazing. She goes into her community, and she does birth work, and she comes to us um, in the fall and says, we've got a problem. Uh, essentially, the need is way too big for her to, to handle alone. And so um, she and us come up with this solution. So we have now trained and skilled up and certified seven of her peers. And they are now officially the Cherished Hearts Family Support Services. I have to say that slow. <laughs> um, uh, LLC. And they are birth workers in their community making a difference in the lives of their family and their friends every single day. I tell that story because my brain as a businesswoman is at the finances, right? But the reason why we're doing what we're doing, the reason why we are doing these, making these business decisions is so we can enable people like Jack, Jackie is what she goes by, um, to um, do what she's doing and to continue to make a difference. So the well certification um, puts a little bit of um, formalization around that program um, as well as um, moves us forward. Uh, we at this point would be able to um, make a small income. This would be our passive income strategy. The vision is that it would be a um, um, online teachable course um, that people would be able to sign up for to be able to learn our business tactics as well as our care as well as our care standards. Um, and so the cost for $300 a session is actually very low, um, would entail quite a bit, but little from us outside of the upfront investment, um, and be able to make sure that um, you know, people like Jackie, um, as she is in Avondale, you know, people in California, they can have and understand the pillars that we work with to make sure that we can raise our standards of healthcare across the board. Okay, so I want to just be truthful. I had 
fully intended on this being the end of the presentation. There was gonna be a lot more in there, um, but I um, am just really grateful for everything that we've received through this competition. Um, so um, big feedback from our mentor, regular timelines. Um, I've done a lot of work in Excel and that's not something that I love. Um, and so because of this, uh, once we started going, it was really hard to stop. And I think we kind of realized that the sky is the limit once we really put some numbers behind what we are doing. Um, so I'm really excited to tell you about something that um, is kind of like a pipe dream. When I first started volunteering at the well, um, it came up in multiple conversations, but of like years down the road, one day. Um, but I'm really excited to share that we have dreams of opening a birth center. And um, that is actually a reality. And I didn't realize how close we are to that um, until this competition. So um, if we are to move um, at the pace that we have outlined, um, which is you know, a, a little bit of a generic timeline, um, we can begin renovations in about 12 to 15 months, and we can have a birth center with the very first birth being in January of 2025. And that is just like breathtaking. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of detail of what this entails. Um, this is going to be a happy medium for those who are not interested in a hospital setting, but those who want, um, who, who still aren't interested in a home birth, but who want something a little bit more in between. We would only be the second birth center in the tri-state area. The first one in Cincinnati, I believe it's only been open about 30 days. Um, and uh, we have a few different um, options for the physical location all in-house, which is fantastic. So we don't have to worry about purchasing a new building. And then lastly, we would be a licensed facility in the state of Ohio, meaning we would be able to accept all major insurances as well as Medicaid, which is a huge win. Uh, also something that isn't available when you are having a home birth, so just filling such a big need. Um, and who would we be serving? We would be serving low-risk mothers of all ages, economic and racial backgrounds, um, those who know us and those who don't, and those who can afford it, and thanks to our scholarship fund, those who can't and who need a little bit of help. Okay, so uh, again, I'm going to kind of bring us back down from the business speak, and I just really want to talk about why this is important. So um, from an outcome standpoint, maternal outcomes are worse in the United States than any other developed country, and that's for a number of reasons. Our chronic disease, our C-section practices, um, systemic racism, um, and you can see right here, we've got great examples. Birth center outcomes are stronger than hospital outcomes, so this is a no-brainer. We all want healthy moms and babies. Next, experience. There are two different schools of thought that I want to talk through. So there's the medical care model, um, which believes essentially that um, pregnancy is an illness and a doctor will be able to um, ensure that everything happens the way it should, in usually a hospital. Um, the midwifery model care, care midwifery care model is um, a little bit different. It is that um, our bodies and our babies were literally created to do this and um, in a natural way we will set you up for a, um, a healthy pregnancy so we can sit back and watch a very boring birth. Um, so uh, those are, um, in both of those are wonderful things, right? There are some people that very much want to go to a hospital and my sister watched New Girl through her entire delivery and that was wonderful for her. Um, and there are others who want a little bit of a different experience and we will be able to offer that. And then lastly, I want to talk about cost. Um, so the way that we have babies in this country is really expensive and I've done it three times so I can speak from experience. Um, but as you can see, 54% of Ohio births are covered by Medicaid. 42% of Medicaid births end in a C-section, and there's a $7,000 difference between the two. Um, and then I just have to, again, share, um, we have a scholarship fund, and how wonderful that we would then be able to provide that little bit of extra support for those that won't be able to afford it otherwise. So this required a totally different business plan. Um, so I have updated completely, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I know, uh, judges, you have this in front of you. Um, the things that I am going to talk about as we move forward are staffing, marketing, as well as our cost structure. So staffing, this is why we got into this competition in the first place, right? I needed some guidance and some solutions on how to make this happen. 
Um, and I just want to point out that in the, when, at the beginning of the presentation, when I started talking about the well, we were looking for a full-time director and a part-time administrator. Um, and uh, I just want to do this, right? Um, if we look at the, the growth um, that we potentially have the opportunity to have, it is just amazing um, at making such a difference in this community. So um, from a staffing standpoint, this is obviously our largest expense, um, and I have staggered our approach um, to make sure we have a smooth ramp up, um, and you'll see that again with the births as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the like heavy hitters for me, and that's the director of the well and the director of patient care. So the director of the well um, would be the right hand of the founder. So I envision this person to um, be the one to continue to systemize processes so we can move at the pace we need to move at. Um, this person would be responsible for um, helping to source practitioners, onboard them, make sure they're trained, take feedback from our clients. This person would also be responsible for managing our um, workshop calendar and then as we mentioned earlier um, growing our um, client membership totals as well as um, driving our certification program. Um, then the um, director of patient care is specific to the birth center. So this person is a certified nurse midwife and this is required by Ohio law um, to be in position. So this person would be responsible for all things people at the birth center. So um, first partnering with our overseeing doctor to make sure that we are um, handling all situations in the best possible way. The low, the low risk moms are in the right place, the high risk moms are in the right place. Um, she would be responsible for um, intake, for the training of the midwives, for making sure that we're staying current on all practices. Um, and so these two um, are just one of 12, um, or two of 12, that would be um, just so critical for the success of our business. Um, as I talked about already, we would be staggering as well, and so um, it's important for me to note that um, we will be doing some hiring for the well in January, and then for the birth center in July, and then in November, and then we're still able to um, staff for these positions as well in 2025. Um, this staffing piece is so important, and having the right people in place is so important. Uh, we've actually already started putting our feelers out there and finding the people that we would like on this team to make sure that it is um, appropriate and, and the best fit for everybody. Okay, next I wanna give a very high level overview of some marketing. So we've invested around $42,000 um, in 2024 and 2025. So this um, would largely cover some of these strategies. So um, word of mouth and in-house marketing is actually something we've learned is our strongest avenue of marketing. Um, and uh, so we are just gonna continue to lean into this strategy, leverage that current army that we have ready to go, um, also continue to offer um, in-house workshops. Obviously for the birth center, we'll tailor them a little bit more towards the birth center, um, and then we'll have plenty of open houses. I wanna really talk about community outreach and digital. So um, first we would begin by targeting these individual communities in Dayton to make sure that um, everybody is aware of what we offer, not just those that surround our um, physical location. Um, so we would make sure um, that they are aware that we're on a bus line, that um, we have this scholarship program to make sure everybody understands the accessibility um, of this birth center. And then I also want to talk about our board of directors. As they are continuing to build our scholarship fund, um, it's important to make sure that they are tailoring their delivery. So we are using that as an advertising um, opportunity as well. And then from a digital standpoint, um, we already have a website. We already um, have a social media presence. However, growing something like this is obviously going to require so much more. So we do have um, some SEO, some blog writing um, to make sure that we are able to keep up um, with um, the trends and with the demands. Okay, so um, this is where like things got really crazy. So I started um, crunching some numbers in Excel, and as I mentioned, my um, mentor, she had me go back several times and redo and add and plan B and plan C, and I am super excited to give you an overview of what this looks like, um, because this is what 
helped us realize that this was a reality. Um, so I have us broken up into two separate buckets. We're going to talk about the birth center first, and then I will combine that with the well at the end so we can see total picture. Um, I also want to add that between 2024 and 2025, we will be needing a loan. Um, we are hoping some of those will be forgivable. We're hoping for some, um, some donors, so um, we won't have to repay those back. Um, and we're already sourcing those a little bit. We're already writing grants. Um, however, so you won't see those numbers in your um, calculations, because we're not quite sure where that's going to come from yet. But we're looking for about $300,000 to invest up front for the birth center. Um, the buckets that I want to touch on, the heaviest, are building expenses. I'm going to just put that together with equipment. Those are all the things we need for a birth center. That will include the renovation of the space, whichever space we decide to go on. Um, that will be um, equipment um, to make sure that we can fully function. Those will be the birthing tubs, right? Um, then I also want to talk about staffing. We kind of already touched on that, um, but this would be huge. So those two people that would begin right as renovations begin would be able to really help continue to propel us forward and um, help us to make sure we stayed on track for that uh, January go live date. Um, I did highlight the monthly spent on here as well. You can see as soon as we hit the back half of the year, that's when things get really pricey because of all of that staffing. Okay, so kind of ugly numbers. <laughs> um, we hit 2025, and look at that. Um, so we have staggered births to make sure that we're not going um, too fast as we kind of have already experienced. Doesn't feel that great. Um, and if we just start at four a month, which is very under what we can um, what we can accommodate with three rooms, we should be able to easily have 12 births a month. And um, so you can see this very steady ramp up feels very, very good for our first year. Um, so with this alone, it's about 90 births, and um, we're looking at a little over $600,000 um, in income. Um, so that already is providing a net. That's including staffing, including um, everything except for really the loan, which could be anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 a month, depending on the avenues that we go. Um, so before I move on from this page, like I saw this and I'm like really excited and we, again, I probably make another Excel sheet, um, but I want to slow down because this is 90 births, this is 90 babies that are brought into this world in a really beautiful way with a team that is amazing and supported to making sure their experience is wonderful, babies that have stronger outcomes because they're in a safer environment for their needs and for their wants. Um, Babies that have a lower, sec, uh, lower chance of having to have a C-section um, or complications because they've been taken care of and treated in the right way. And I think when we slow it down in that sense, it's just, again, really, truly breathtaking. Okay, so now this is our total numbers um, combined with the wells. So you can see this is just birth center. You can see what we've spent, um, including staffing, um, how our rent um, adjustments, our administrative fees, and our client membership um, really make an impact against that. 2024 is kind of ugly. <laughs> and then... Um, 2025 is not so ugly, and uh, we're already looking at $100,000 um, with just our first year. So I did a quick, um, a quick calculation that if we deliver an average of 10 births a month during the year of 2026, we're looking at $900,000 coming in. Um, obviously, that's going to require a little bit more staffing, um, but we're still looking at $200,000 $200, in net, um, which is just unbelievable considering the fact that literally six months ago, I was like, I just want someone to answer the phones. <laughs> so this is a really, really exciting for us. Okay, um, that's what I have. I want to close out with, this was my, uh, this was my slide uh, from our first presentation. Um, this is what I thought I needed. I needed these four things. There were four bullet points. Um, and just for kicks and giggles, this is Jacqueline. Um, and this is April, our founder. Um, and so this was what I really thought I needed. Um, and this is where we are today. Um, 
So if we continue to move at the pace at which we've predicted and at the timelines that we are hoping for, we will drive loyalty among our clients. We will continue to grow to serve more and more across this country. Um, we will be sustainable, which is huge. Oh, but we're going to have a full-time staff, and we're going to open a birth center at the same time. Um, so I just want to wrap it up with I am so grateful. I came into this competition knowing that there would be some mentoring and knowing that there would be some challenges and some workshops. Um, but we've come out like totally opposite of where I thought we would, and that's really because of all that we've gained from here. So thank you so much. So I'm going to wait because my cup is overflowing with questions. <laughs> So go ahead. Okay. This is really good. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Okay. My my first question for you is um, I really like uh, the the idea of your future practice having uh, these these fees. Um, my concern is that as I'm look, listening more and more to the fees and I'm hearing the sensitivity around scholarships, I, I wanna acknowledge that. My fear is that this is going to turn into more of like a class uh, model if you have it, if you got the money, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what you walked into was a parity model. Mm -hmm. I heard you, I, I hear it. My concern is that when you start talking about client membership and loyalty, I mm -hmm. hear that. The unintended consequences because of the way that the model is set up and you don't know your pregnancies really until you're in it and your needs until you're mm -hmm. in it. You also know, which I want, you to, I want you to throw out a little bit more, is that communities that are of poverty, including Appalachian communities, but then that are inflated, conflated with race. And then obviously this is a gender justice issue that you don't know when you have a bad pregnancy because race is an issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Racism is an issue. So in that, if you tear it, my concern is that those that need you the most, the mm -hmm. most marginalized communities can't afford it, and they need the most, mm -hmm. and your, mm -hmm. your goal is parity. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could take that exact same model. I hear you, right? You need boundaries, people are exhausted. I bet you the people who are really, really exhausted are those that are taking care of the poorest communities. So think about hospitals and on call and how you guys support each other from a peer system and share, mm -hmm. share that lift. So sometimes you're off and sometimes you're on and you're being covered yeah. as you guys get bigger. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could take that cost off of your membership. Everyone gets the same membership needs because parity has to, you know, if you don't need it as much, I'm going to still help you on this other side. And yeah. I wonder if you could move it to the well certification growth, mm -hmm. charge more. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is exceptional, mm -hmm. right? It's exceptional mm -hmm. and you should be charging much, much more yeah. because people who want to invest in their business should be investing in their business mm -hmm. heavily. You shouldn't be asking women to invest in the care that they need from yeah. you, yeah. right? Yeah, Okay. I think that's okay. really fair. Okay, and then I'm gonna do one more and I'm gonna shut up so let just one more person talking and I'm gonna jump back <laughs> in. Okay, I would, I love, I love, this birth sending model and that you're, you're putting numbers towards, I love it. But I am also going to say that there's a reason why there's not tons of birth centers. Okay. So I need, you, didn't, you didn't have any money in there for your insurance. It's going to skyrocket. It is. Oh, I didn't see Yes. It. Okay. There is liability insurance. Okay. Well, there's like seven uh, Excel tabs. So if okay. you didn't get to all, okay. I understand. Um, Make yeah, sure that those there's, numbers, there's, as you increase, you know mm -hmm. this, you are going to have stillbirths. You yeah. are going to have miscarriages. You're going to have complications. You're going to have abrupt two. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're going to have things that just that just yeah. spill out, I hate to say yeah. that. But, and you're going to have to have some back costs to take care of all yeah. of that. I would say there probably isn't enough in there. We have insurance yes. covered. We don't have the other I, details I, it, covered. Yeah. It needs to be, mm -hmm. it actually needs to be like, spelled out the more you increase the Yeah, okay. I am really excited. There is a, um, the American Association of Birth Centers has a, um, a conference every year in October, and they have a two-day workshop on how to open up a birth center um, in October this year. So um, we will at least have one, the founder is going, and hopefully I'll be going as well, um, because that'll really spell out what we're missing. We have partnered with Cincinnati. Um, they, as I said, just opened in, I wanna say it was the beginning of April. Maybe their open house was 
end of March. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really, they, they feel good about our starting point. And so I think um, with their help as well, um, we'll just continue to, to get stronger. Okay, that's right. Okay, I didn't know that. So race and class are different. And I hear a lot in there about mm -hmm. class, and I think because of that, it's conflated a little bit with race. Yeah. And that needs to be spelled out yep. differently. Fair. Fair. We have more fiber. We, we have ev more of everything when mm -hmm. it comes to women's health needs. Mm -hmm. And if you really are going to start taking care of black and brown women, mm -hmm. that needs to feel different than the class. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fair. Good. That's good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give a big round of applause for all. This has been a long process, nine months of sweat, blood, and tears to put business plans, pitches together, working with mentors. And so we're very appreciative that you chose the flyer pitch to be a part and to ultimately get money for your nonprofit. Um, so the judges are tabulating, but before we end today, I just want to give a special thank you to all of our sponsors, to PNC Bank, New York Studios, the Entrepreneur Center, Flying Consulting, among others who were a part of this process to make it all possible. So um, again, uh, make sure that you guys are ready to hear the winners on Tuesday. So we'll be in the rotunda on Tuesday at 6 p.m. for our ENT banquet. We'll announce the winners for all of the tracks. Once again, my name is Whitney Barkley. Special thank you to Colton for assisting me today. He's one of our business associates, and we will see you guys on Tuesday. Have a great Yay. weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.